Hello, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Michał Wiśniewski, I represent the International Cultural Center and I have the privilege to moderate the session dedicated to resilience. Uh, it is a sixth heritage forum of Central Europe. Uh, we started yesterday. Uh, yesterday we had already <clears throat> three very inspiring presentations dedicated to this topic. <clears throat> Today, uh, before the break, uh, we could uh, see and hear three more. And now it's a time for another three presentations. Uh, this time uh, I would like to welcome uh, the authors coming from Poland and from Spain. Uh, at first, I would like to uh, welcome uh, Alexander, uh, Mr. Alexander Łupienko from Warsaw. Uh, then I would like to welcome the authors of the second uh, presentation of this very panel, uh, Miss Veronika Scherle and uh, uh, Professor Robert Hirsch, both uh, from Gdańsk. And uh, finally, I would like to welcome <clears throat> uh, Dr. Hector Manuel Aliaga de Miguel uh, from Spain. So, um, uh, we are uh, travel across, traveling across various meanings of the word resilience, seeing it in the strategies, seeing it in the work with uh, the memory, uh, right now, uh, we are going to discuss the issue of the city. At first, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Alexander Lupienko, who, as I see, is already with us. Uh, Alexander Lupienko, uh, he's a historian interested in cultural history of urban space in Central and Eastern Europe, along with the cultural history of the conservation of architectural monuments. Uh, Alexander Łupienko works at the Institute of History of the Polish Academy of Sciences in Warsaw in the department led by Professor Maciej Janowski. His latest publications include Order in the Streets, the Political History of Warsaw's Public Space in the First Half of the 19th Century, uh, as well as The City as a National Work of Art, Modernity and Nation Building in Fondesiek Elysium. Uh, the topic of the presentation is heritage, collectivity, and the reproduction of meaning. Alexander Lupienko, welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you for having me on the forum. Um, my presentation is probably the only one dealing exclusively with history, the history of heritage building, because I'm urban his a historian who deals, among others, uh, with the history of monument conservation and nation building. But I truly believe that the conclusions drawn from this research may be of relevance also for heritage managers and cultural activists um, gathered here uh, on the forum. Uh, what I would like to stress here is that the 19th century policy of monument preservation entailed monument listing, assessment, and eventually making the monuments from the past relevant for, uh, for the present, by means of imposing meaning of them, the practice which is continued to this day. Um, sorry. I see, uh, I'm sorry, I see that there is a problem with the presentation. Uh, yeah, it should be, I should be here now. So, um, okay. Uh, to start with, let me show a recent example of bringing new meanings on to on old monuments. It is in Kashgar, in Xinjiang, in China. The Chinese policy towards monument outside the main line is concentrated on strengthening social integrity of the Han nation, often against ethnic minorities. The case in, is, in point is the revered mausoleum of Afar Koja in the city. Um, I don't know why my presentation is moving without my consent. Um, I don't know what is going on. Okay. Um, well, I don't, I don't feel to have full control of the, um, of the presentation, but never mind, uh, I will go on. Um, <clears throat> Uh, Afar Koja, the city which uh, keeps uh, drawing thousands of pilgrim, Uyghur pilgrims and whose significance cannot be simply denied by the state. Instead, the officials decided to pick the history of a Chinese concubine of the local emperor and by means of this to create a narrative which can 
helped to make the place a popular a touristic destination for the Chinese. Um, my paper revolves around the issues and examples provided by the authors of a volume on the entanglements of heritage and nation building. Uh, you can see the cover here, which I co-edited with the Croatian art historian Dragan Damjanovic, and which is going to be published next year at Bergham. Uh, the volume uh, deals mainly with the 19th century monument preservation policies and discourses related to the historic cultural sites. It covers the region, regions lying outside of what we call uh, the Western Europe, including, among others, Russia, um, the then new states of Greece, Romania, Hungary, and Croatian parts of Austria-Hungary, along with today's Poland and Estonia. Um, now the first important issue here is the creative way humankind forms and defines social groups and collectivities. It is nowadays agreed by most of uh, anthropologists uh, that groups don't necessarily follow objective differences between people, but are instead culturally constructed, and it is not the content of the alleged differences that matters, but the symbolic dimension of the boundaries between cultural entities, by, uh, be they the, the ethnic uh, groups or, or indeed nations. Guarding of the boundaries is one of the key strategies of assuring social integrity of a given group. What is, however, most important is the uh, strategy of differentiation, known as nation building, which took place on a mass scale in the 19th century and which encompassed uh, culture rather than politics. The content of the debates related to the strategy is tightly combined with the movement of monument preservation and also with the architectural production of the period in question. Both phenomena were concentrated on the interpretation and reinterpretation of uh, the past defined as national. Mm, the resulting national identification is therefore a matter of imagining and maintaining symbolic boundaries, which implies a dialectic interplay between similarities and differences. Architectural objects and also ways of building, uh, I perceive and uh, imagine traditional manner of transforming um, space in decorating architectural structures played an important role in imagining and maintaining these symbolic boundaries. Uh, symbolic in the full meaning of the word, because symbols which are abstract, imprecise and multifaceted could be used as a unifying umbrella which could um, hide the real differences between people who would bestow their own meanings on them. Architectural monuments serve uh, as such uh, unifying symbols. To be sure, there are many ways in which historians interpret nation building. It can be viewed as a modern construction on the one hand, or as reviving something that has for centuries been there on the other, or simply as something in between, a new modern phenomenon that was based on real historic foundations. What served as a harbinger of a new national consciousness was the idea of a common national past. I propose to conceive of the 19th century idea of nation as a community of inheritors. This idea fits well into the historicist consciousness and a sense of a continuum that permeated the uh, 19th century minds um, back then, uh, and which is in line with, uh, with uh, my, uh, my contribution to the uh, proceedings of the Fourth Heritage Forums published two years ago. Um, the new 19th century uh, nation-states in the Balkans and Austria-Hungary were faced with many dilemmas regarding the heritage that was, <clears throat> that was needed for the purpose of strengthening national integrity and sometimes also defining the nation itself. It was all the more important as in Central Europe, the key region among the ones studied in our volume, was to a large extent multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-religious, in other words, to cite the renowned uh, historian uh, Moritz Czaki, it was uh, essentially hybrid, a creolizing ensemble, and at the same time transnational, translocal, transterritorial, fluid, and not homogeneous or essentialist. This description fits well also to Balkans or the European parts of the Russian Empire. On the other hand, the historic monuments in themselves were not necessarily meant to be pillars of social integrity back in the time of their construction. Their main aim was very often practical, connected to, for example, military security. And even if many buildings conveyed integrational um, meanings, these meanings were connected to the state or dynasty, not the nation, of course. In many instances, 
these their true meanings were um, unretrievable uh, already in the 19th century. The aim of the national protagonist was therefore much more creative than it is sometimes assumed. It was to bring the realm of history, which was indeed a foreign country, to use the well-known pop uh, term popularized by David Loventhal, closer to the present and bestow a new, clear, nationalizing meaning of it. How was it possible to bring new meanings uh, to the silent monuments? Uh, the answer is partly the practice of creating national heritage at the institutional level, which became possible in the 19th century, the century of developed uh, bureaucratic states. These states became communities of a new type whose legitimacy was based not only on dynastic tradition, but also on a national, thus genuinely cultural ideal. A national policy towards the conservation of monuments was of high importance here, um, as, it, uh, as it set in narratives uh, regarding heritage and its role in the final vision of the nation. Um, this vision could be supported by a cultural artistic narratives related to the Enlightenment, based on order on, or old uh, ancient legitimacy, or a more romantic ideal of the presupposed medieval nationhood, which could be based on the medieval styles and later on other styles as well, in, in, in culture and in architecture. One of the chapters of the volume brings the example of modern Greece. The new state, which appeared after 1830, had to be defined along the lines of heritage as well. Here the concept of the revivals uh, is a useful category, which went in hand in hand with the national awakenings. Revival of the ancient cultural tradition was at the head of the 19th century um, architectural thought. An example uh, of this is the medieval revival in the architecture of the independent Greece. This the discovery of the Christian roots of modern uh, Greek art could be paralleled uh, to a similar earlier phenomenon of the classical revival, which appeared in Greece immediately after the War of Independence. The first revival had the aim of looking for continuities in the region's history and establishing Greece as an inheritor of the classical period in Europe's architecture. The other, <coughs> the other revival was a rehabilitation of the medieval and Christian heritage in Greece, along with its art and architecture, which affected the monument, monument preservation uh, policy throughout the last decades of the 19th century until the first half of the 20th. Uh, architectural revivals also characterize the Hungarian debates around monument preservation and the issue of choosing the best suited period in history, uh, represented by an appropriate style, most promising for expressing national distinctiveness. Here the continuity between the allegedly genuinely Hungarian Renaissance upper, uh, upper Hungarian architectural style and the cultural policy of the newly emancipated nation state was the outcome of the debates. Mm. The chapter illustrating the history of the 19th century monument preservation in Romania, a newly united state from the 1860s, uh, is one of a fight for cultural sovereignty. The oriental character of many on uh, an, in, an eastern or southeastern nation in Europe was a discursive figure often applied in the cultural debates. Unlike in Russia, another mm, case, another of the case studies, from the volume were the built heritage of the Kazan, uh, Kazan Hanet. Uh, we have seen uh, the, the, the appropriate picture in, in the opening uh, slide. Uh, brought before the public eye in the first half of the 19th century was eventually reinvented and adopted as part of the imperial heritage and the remains of Bolgar, the capital of the Muslim Kazan Hanet, blended into the new imperial orthodox urban public. In other states, the Oriental heritage was more often used as a cultural stigma. In this case, uh, it was treated as an alleged feature of a national culture that had to be neutralized by expressions of strong and direct bonds with the Western center. The stronger the stigma, the more direct methods of cooperation with the center, as the Romanian example can show. Here the bonds with France were the key leverage uh, to the perceived civilizational advancement. Here the numerous commissions placed by the Romanian government with the French architect and conservationist Emile André Lecomte du Muy are crucial. The architect restored almost all of the most important monuments in the country, some of them literally rebuilt, like the most admired temple at uh, Curtera de Agesh depicted here. Both the Romanian and Greeks saw the mission of unequivocal rejection of the uh, oriental stigma when asserting their place uh, among the uh, European nations.
<coughs> uh, so, um, but as the Romanian example shows, this cooperation with the center brought a reciprocal reaction on the part of younger architects who wanted to create new local architecture which could uh, express the national distinctiveness. The result was a social ostracism of Le Comte de Nuit and all the new commissions being placed to Romanian architects, who, to be sure, were still uh, almost exclusively trained in France. Mm. The last case study uh, here to be uh, delineated here are the debates of the national art and architecture in the territories of the defunct Polish uh, Lithuanian Commonwealth. The debates conducted in the context of often uh, difficult circumstances of a nation without state, sandwiched between three expanding empires of Russia, Russia, and Austria, show that even the lack of official possibilities did not prevent debates about uh, cultural pillars of uh, groupness. Moreover, the debates were made even more heated after around 1870, when the social Darwinist uh, spirit started to permeate thinking, also on culture, and when the European nations were imagined as waging a cultural struggle for not merely recognition, but national survival. Here, the issue of the Gothic heritage and the new neo-Gothic architectural production appeared to be a solution or even a cultural salvation for the Poles. All these examples show the collective role played by heritage in the 19th century, used and abused, adopted, adapted to the needs of the present. What binds them together, all of these uh, histories, are the conclusions regarding human inventiveness and creativity. I agree with the scholars who claim that there is no naturalness in social distinctions, in uh, cultural content and the boundaries. The restored old monuments and the new built environment conceived of in neo styles in the 19th century were by no means uh, anything old. They were new productions serving new needs. And to, conclu to conclude, uh, as it was said yesterday and is constantly reminded in the heritage theory, heritage is always in a process of change. Historic temples and castles started to be refurbished, restored, or even you know, consciously rebuilt in the 19th century, and very often, and very often, what we see today is mainly the production not of the medieval master builders, but the 19th century conservationists. What is more, the cost of restoring monuments was not insignificant back then. Uh, uh, Sorry again. Uh, it was not insignificant back then, even though uh, the norms applied by conservationists were a long time much looser than in the 20th century. The whole policy of restoring the built heritage can be seen as a kind of investment in integrity, even in frequently not labeled originally as such, of course. One can today look at these practices as something suitable mainly for the previous two centuries. But if one takes into account the need of constructing togetherness on large scale in Europe in the context of a rapidly fragmented world, as highlighted in the keynote lecture yesterday, uh, it may turn out that the issue of bringing social and cultural integrity through heritage is as valid and pressing as 200 years ago. Uh, thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to hearing your, hearing your questions and, and comments. Thank you so much. Uh, indeed, it was um, a very historical presentation, uh, a different perspective. Uh, thank you for that. And uh, well, um, uh, yes, actually, I should uh, ask the, all of the participants uh, for the questions. Uh, please use chat uh, to ask them. Uh, after the end of the third presentation, we will have the time uh, for the questions and answers. Anyway, uh, thank you so much uh, for uh, the presentation. And right now, I would like to give the floor for the authors of the second presentation of this very uh, of this very part of the resilience session. Uh, the second presentation was prepared by two authors, by Veronika Scherle uh, from Gdańsk University of Technology and uh, from Robert Hirsch also from Gdańsk University of Technology. Uh, Veronika Scherle, uh, she's an art historian, co-curator of award-winning exhibitions, e.g. Szkło Metal Detail Architektura Gdyni w Szczegółach, <coughs> Glass Metal Detail Gdynia's Architecture Close-Up, 
in 2016. Uh, she's a PhD student at Gdańsk University of Technology, uh, Department of History, Theory of Architecture and Monuments. Uh, she works in the art department uh, Gdynia City Museum. As part of Gdynia's Modernism Trail, she conducts architectural walkabouts. Uh, concerning the second author, Robert Hirsch, uh, he's associate professor at Gdańsk University of Technology, Department of History, Theory of Architecture and Monument Conservation. Uh, he's a member of the board of ICOMOS Poland uh, and head of Municipal Office of Monuments Protection in Gdynia. So this time uh, we will uh, move to the Baltic Sea coast. Uh, and uh, I should say that the title of the presentation is A Noblement of um, Anaptrasive Heritage as the Path to its Protection as demonstrated by the modernist architecture of Gdynia. Oh, I just heard that uh, we have some technical problem. So, however, I can see Veronika Scherle on the uh, on the chat. Uh, I don't know why uh, authors did not uh, join us yet. So in this case, um, I would like uh, the colleagues who are responsible for the technicities of this um, conference to uh, attempt to contact with the authors. And uh, I, I would like right now to uh, move uh, to the third author of, to the author of the third presentation of this very session. Uh, maybe, oops, uh, it looks, it looks that we have a problem and uh, the author of the uh, next presentation, Mr. Hector Manuel Aliaga, is also absent. Uh, so um, I have a question to the colleagues responsible for the technicities to contact uh, the authors and maybe we will be able to, to uh, catch uh, catch uh, uh, with them. And uh, uh, if uh, we have some time, I would like to uh, go back to the presentation of uh, Alexander Lupienko uh, and uh, ask about one question. Uh, you mentioned that the nation uh, might be seen as a community of uh, inheritors. Uh, it's a very intriguing uh, interpretation of the 19th century uh, way of uh, dealing with uh, cultural heritage and with monuments. Uh, how would you describe the contemporary uh, societies uh, and their relationship uh, with the cultural heritage? Oh, well, a tricky question. I'm a historian, not a sociologist or, or observer of the current situation, but um, what is uh, important, what I would like to say is that the, today's nations uh, and the states especially uh, are, um, are inheritors of the 19th century states. So the uh, way um, heritage is seen and evaluated and, um, and, and also protected is uh, in many ways similar to that of the 19th century, late 19th century, when it uh, finally appeared as a as a, a as a ready product uh, for the for, for the future, uh, so uh, that's why I think uh, many nations can still be described like this. Uh, there is an idea of the common heritage, which of course includes not only the uh, monuments from the past, historical buildings uh, to be sure, but uh, which um, which um, encompasses uh, almost everything, like the heritage of literature, heritage of uh, of, the, of the history in general. And uh, that is supposed to bind the nation uh, once again, like in the past, uh, uh, it is still valid, although new trends, of course, are emerging. And um, that's natural that a cosmopolitan culture uh, is um, uh, gaining the upper hand. But I can add that the end of the 1970s was also another high period of cosmopolitanism, the first real cosmopolitanism. Uh, in the uh, in the, uh, world's history, uh, so uh, the parallels uh, go uh, much deeper than uh, than one could uh, one could imagine. Uh, 
I think that may be the answer to your question, I hope. Uh, well, yes, uh, indeed. Uh, in your presentation, you uh, shown that uh, actually heritage is a constant uh, production, production of meaning, production of uh, symbols. And uh, uh, I'm really uh, wondering about this parallel with the contemporary. And uh, if today we again are somehow uh, becoming uh, a society very dependent on the symbols, uh, defined in a different way, but maybe uh, also so very important as it was in the uh, 19th century. I don't know if you would like to add anything. Mm -hmm. Well, I was talking about the fragmenting world. Uh, which we see now, nowadays, uh, the, the world of uh, not only the pandemic, which uh, separates people, but also the world of uh, new inventing, inventing or, um, let's say, discovering uh, a new, uh, new, uh, let's say, new um, uh, cultural and uh, historical heritages, uh, new uh, ways of perceiving the past, uh, group past, uh, more local uh, oriented uh, approaches are gaining uh, the upper hand and uh, that is why the, the the need for for uh, for the integration the new need for um, of um, integrating the uh, society around some uh, central uh, central features central uh, objects uh, of heritage is important but it is very tricky to find them it is more and more um, uh, tricky, uh, as we can see, uh, for example, in Poland, we have new policy of um, bringing posts together around um, uh, some symbols, around some uh, most important tradition, which are uh, which are not only generated but maybe regenerated uh, again and again uh, under new slogans, under uh, uh, and serving new purposes, but. Um, but it is this policy uh, is uh, is uh, today uh, is today again uh, becoming more important, more important than a few years ago, for example. So uh, so this is this is very uh, this is very nice to to uh, to to deal with history and to study it because it uh, shows so many similarities, so many um, similar trends in the past that led somewhere. Of course, I don't. I don't. Um, I will not uh, admit or state that uh, these these trends may lead us again to the same conclusions or to the same uh, outcomes. But uh, but it's nice to, to see them and to, to observe uh, how they uh, are uh, presented, how they are um, uh, function today, and uh, what future may they bring to us. Thank you so very much. Uh, and uh, are there any questions? I can see any questions on the chat. Uh, if there are no questions and uh, we don't have contact at the moment with the other panelists, uh, I should have... Oh, I just get the information that uh, our third speaker, Mr. Hector Manuel Aliaga de Miguel, is uh, already with us. So, Alexander, thank you so much. Uh, I hope that we will be back uh, again after this very session. So, please stay with us. And uh, right now, uh, we will move from Warsaw to, uh, to Madrid. Uh, Hector Manuel Aliaga de Miguel uh, represents the uh, Santa Maria La Real Fundacion. Uh, he's a PhD candidate in sustainability and urban uh, regeneration. Uh, his master is in cultural heritage in the 21st century, management and investigation. Uh, he also uh, holds master in architecture and bachelor in architecture at the university, both at the University of Polytechnic uh, of Madrid. Uh, and uh, he has worked in Foundation Santa Maria La Real on the following projects like H2020 uh, Impactor, H2020 Texture, H2020 uh, Ruritash, uh, among the others. So 
Hector, welcome uh, in Central Europe. Welcome uh, at the Sixth Heritage Forum of uh, Central Europe. Uh, the name of the presentation is Alternative Heritage Resources in Large Cities for Sustainable and uh, Participatory Development Proposals. The case of Madrid. Good, good afternoon. Do you hear me properly? Do you hear me? Okay. Okay. So I'm 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 gonna start. First of all, I want to thank uh, thank uh, say thank you very much to um to this uh, great opportunity to introduce myself into this uh, Mason um, um, meeting during these three days. And uh, I want to say hello and greetings from Madrid to everybody. And uh, I'm very happy to share with you my presentation, which is actually based on some of the studies I'm doing during my PhD in the Polytechnic University of Madrid. As you can read over there, the title is Alternative Heritage Resource in Large Cities uh, for Sustainable and Participatory Development Proposals, in this case, the city of Madrid. So, um, no okay it's moving perfect over there you have the structure of these presentations and we're gonna just have a i'm gonna show a little introduction the main objective of this research then how the first uh, steps the evolution and process why i'm doing this research the justification for this project furthermore uh different approaches we're doing with this um with this research in the geographical way legal way social frame and technological frame as well. A final, um, well, another step, the social awareness, how population is important to get their collaboration and they should be aware what is needed about cultural heritage. And finally, some graphic examples um, for, I mean, to let you know how it works, um, what is uh, an example, graphic example, uh, of this uh, alternative um, cultural heritage in mixed cities, and some conclusions that I have already, because I have already done some collaboration with some other uh, entities such as ICOMS Spain. So over there you have like in this introduction, um, well, the title again is Alternative Heritage Resource in Las Cities. And the objective, the main objective is the enhancement of less visible cultural heritage as a catalyst for new proposals of sustainable and participatory development in the areas outside the historic city center of big cities. In this case, Madrid is, is, is the example used for this presentation. Later, you're gonna see how the city center is connected with um, urban around it and why it is important to consider large cities and the areas around uh, out of the city center. Some key words that should be related or linked to this presentation could be urban cultural heritage, neighborhood identity, mapping study, participatory actions, planning, and sustainable development, or some new technologies. The main objective of this um, research, and, and not only this presentation, but the whole process, is um, to really save more the less visible urban cultural heritage in big cities. And it is linked or related to the sustainable development Go number 11 and especially 11 the task 11 4 um 11.4 so uh this main objective it is uh, built uh on two two sub objective or another approximate uh, approximative objective that should be the first one the definition of current urban cultural heritage so which is a common human heritage nowadays i don't know why okay and uh, the other is to create a digital help a digital tool to help and support in this new definition or this new cultural heritage. So there's a lot of cultural heritage not well known, and it should, uh, and we want to um, uh, have a, um, a list of this uh, resource based on the social awareness, the contributions and participation of uh, the neighbors involved in these areas. So this process have uh, like, uh, uh, timeline starting from from bibliography studies, some urban walks and and creating some index cards to to get all the information and put it together in those cards. Then some participatory workshops in order to include the um, the opinion and the and the experience of the neighbors and the inhabitants of those areas. And finally, elaborate a digital tool where all these ideas, new knowledge, and concepts should be included. 
So actually, they should be then this knowledge created could be used in education projects such as, for example, uh, children's or uh, teenagers or even um, old people who live in those uh, areas and cities, or maybe to know and protect better our cultural heritage less known in big cities and some etc. Right now, we are at, the, at this time in this I mean, this timeline process is in the middle right now, so it has already defined some urban works, uh, the areas, and some um, main um, heritage resource. And uh, we're moving into the participatory approach and how we can include the option, the opinions of society into this process. Finally, these last goals or these last objectives we want to, to keep in mind uh, should be established in a long term. Um, option or position because it takes longer to get really applied and uh, useful for society. Uh, this, uh, of course, this project, it does not come uh, itself only uh, um, because of this research, but it's based on some other strategies that already ha is happening in Madrid. Uh, it is used Madrid just because it's the city where I live, so I really know better this, this, this city. I can talk better about this cultural heritage. Some of these initiatives uh, promoted by the municipality of Madrid could be Open House Madrid, as you can see over there, the MOM, which is Madrid Otras Miradas, in, in English should be Madrid, some other glance or looks, or uh, Madrid 21 des Destinies or Destinos. Um, this is the name of the, of the initiative. And over there you can see some logos of these strategies. As well, uh, my personal experience in uh, re being a resident of Madrid can really, and in the district of Ciudadanel, which is actually indeed the, the main area detected uh, for this case of a study also helps. So in this case, for example, you can see how some uh, uh, urban places in Madrid in the district of Ciudad Lineal has already been proposed to be rearranged and uh, reconstructed in order to include a new um, urban sustainable mobility, some um, other social spaces to really people have uh, public uh, places to, to, to live in and to collaborate. And however, in this new project, although they really can or could include cultural heritage into this process, they refuse to do it and they just based on some um, materials and uh, pavements, um, new technologies or maybe green areas, but not including the resource that these areas or district of Madrid could include into this process. And, uh, of course, to really approach it to understand how this complex uh, strategy should be um, uh, place or should be established, there are like same, same main frames to justify these approaches, the geographical, the legal, the social and the technological. So we're going to go not very in detail because we have no time, but um, a little bit uh, explain what it means. So first of all, in this case, we have um, for the geographical frame, why to choose a large or big city? You have already a map of a study that is done, it's done by myself. So you can see the huge area of Madrid, some project that I have, have seen highlighted. No, okay, this is this is the, the slide. And, um, and of course you can see how uh, it is going from dark color to lighter colors. Uh, it, 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 it answers or it, it responds the um, timeline. So this is the more historical area and the lighter it, go, it goes, it is more new. And in the, actually in Papua, it is, has been uh, highlighted a period between from the 40s and the 60s of the 20th century, because during that period, I'm going to explain later for you, uh, Madrid, it grew up uh, a lot. So it had like before the 50s of the last century, about 1 million and a half people. And right now, after this period, this moment, it uh, turned into more than 3 million people. So it means that really those areas uh, surrounding the city center um, have uh, more than half of the population of the city. And of course, there should be some cultural heritage in those areas that should be valorized and included because it is a large area and a large number of inhabitants. In comparison, you can just see in red how I circle the main area of Madrid and I just out of the 21 districts that already make part of the city, just here in this area should be maybe include the six or eight, six or eight, it depends on who measures this 
these decisions, but uh, in the six to eight more ancient districts of, of the city. And over there, we can find approximately only 800,000 inhabitants, which is less than a million out of the 300, uh, three, three million, three hundred thousand of inhabitants that the Madrid capital of Spain has. Um, and finally, over there, uh, surrounded in blue, you have um, what I said before, from the 40s till the 60s, because Madrid was growing up a lot, there were like 13 villages around, those are the villages in blue, that they were included into into the into the city of Madrid with a master plan, which was called um, a, a Vigador plan, an urban uh, plan, to include some historical areas of ancient villages into the into the main area of Madrid. So it is another justification that in the surrounding neighborhoods that we can also find some historical buildings or uh, ancient villages or areas that should be included and treated into this presentation. Um, then when we're talking about the legal frame, we wanna I would like to share with you a comparison and of course uh, keeping in mind DOD is 11.4 how uh, we should move from the, something uh, more based on the law, um, the Spanish law from the 1985, which is more focused on heritage protection. And this historical heritage law, um, it, it, it focused mainly on the assets and the physical monuments, uh, only to protect them and only to um, keep it physically. However, this this law is already it is already used, but it's quite quite old because it's more than it's about thirty five years old, and maybe we should focus on some other more recent initiative. And to compare it, we have like this um, idea of participation with heritage, approved or or valorized in the uh, FARO Convention of uh, the value of cultural heritage for society in two thousand and five. And in this in this convention, actually, the Council of Europe proposed to really include the, uh, the valorization of cultural heritage by society and how society perceives this, this resource. And uh, of course, the social frame or this uh, to get those people included into this into this into these actions, this participatory and social process should be for sustainable development should be included since the beginning. So before those huge projects were mainly focused on in the academia. Uh, in three main um, key uh, agents, which were the academia, the state, and the, the industry. As far as we can keep included and improving this strategy, uh, this uh, three three Alex uh, model improved or changed into the quadruple Alex model, including over here society. And uh, this uh, lately has um, recently has. In also included uh, um, improved into the uh, quintuple helix model where not only society but as well um, in the, the the environment is included so it means that for huge and complex projects as the one i'm explaining to you today not only these main actors should be um, considered into this process but as well as society and um, environment um, actually, of course, all this process of mapping, studying, getting information, putting in common with society and all this stuff should be included in a more technological way. And this is how the technological frame, it's, uh, it comes, it, it appears, and why using some apps. So, um, actually, the use of new technologies can really support to reach more heritage resource to read to more heritage resources, to get to know them and to really analyze and uh, to really um, preserve those uh, less known uh, cultural heritage resources. And we can use citizens as uh, planner. Planner, it is a French uh, word and it means some uh, like people who go to just have a look before, like in, in advance. And uh, we could like help or help this project with some citizens that, want to be included into this process, working as as, um, as people who go to have a look in those district or less known areas in order to identify or really get to know those resources. Some examples of these, of these, um, of these uh, apps 
and technological uh, uh, support is in one side here on the right and it has already this uh, there's already an app existing in madrid and it helps it it's it's it is um, defined to really uh, advise by the citizens if in the road we have any problem because there is a there's a whole or there is a problem with a tree or whatever so people you can just go through the street take a picture and send it to the application so you can an expert can go over there and check it and see if anything is going on and, and solve the problem. And also here in the iCommerce Spain, um, one of the iCommerce Spain, Spain activities has been doing an uh, observatory of, of heritage in iCommerce. And over there we have included main, main, a lot of a lot of cultural heritage resource. And then in the same way it has been done here, maybe some ideas should be included into this process. And uh, of course, with all these frames, the geographical, the legal, the technological, and uh, and the um, and and the social, we want to uh, really try to get you know how people uh, could support and help us into this into this process because uh, inhabitants of a city are the real experts of. Uh, what could be uh, and something uh, as an identity for them in their neighborhoods. And this is why people should be included into the process. Over there, you can read like collaborative and part participative workshop as a future proposal because it is already trying to be defined, of course, due to COVID-19 problems. And this action should be have done uh, a few months ago, but due to COVID-19 problems, it is not possible to really go together in big groups uh, to stay in a room and discuss about these topics or maybe go for a walk and show to the people some of these alternative resource. And it is planned to, to, to do it like uh, later when the vaccine process goes better. And uh, indeed, uh, all over the, the district that you have seen already in blue surrounding the city center of Madrid, uh, two of them uh, are already uh, chosen by, uh, for this research. One is the Tuarina, and actually it is just because I live there and you know it very well, so I can explain it better to all inhabitants, the neighbors that want to be want to take part to this into this process and on the other side we have another historical district which is called Fuencarral in the north of the city and um, those two districts have different uh, realities different approaches and they can be later compared between them uh, to see how the urban heritage um, historic heritage urban resource cultural resource can be combined and uh, and uh, and uh, mixed to, together. And of course, this process should be not only in one session, but in different weeks session for about a month or a month, a month and a half. So we can, uh, in different steps, really uh, stay in touch with the neighborhoods of the area and explain them the objectives of the project and how we can in, uh, change, exchange opinions with them in order to learn from their experience as inhabitants. And we can uh, also uh, explain to them the objectives of this of this um, research. And uh, well, actually, uh, I'm uh, almost finishing because, of course, this is a large, this is a huge uh, proposal. But before, last but not least, before finishing, I wanted to show to show to you to share with you some of the examples that in the district of Tianina, which is actually in the north north east of the city this um uh, this uh, heritage resource should be included or could be included into the heritage we have in madrid so going by one by one here on the left we have building this building it was built in the 60s by an architect which was called miguel fisac but although it was an impressive building uh, and a monumental and, and very used as a urban landmark nowadays missing is disappeared because during the 19th it was destroyed and it was destroyed actually because there was no lodge protected because it was not um considered as a heritage and this is one of the justifications and other examples of why this research is important for large cities because normally they spread and they be, and they grow up so quickly that we just focus on city center and we forget that sometimes in some areas and regions surrounding we can find good examples of of heritage and the second example we have sent uh, another building which is called um 
Megonia and the Cyber Residential, but it's based on it is it is based and uh, inspired into the um, uh, Unité d'habitation de Le Corbusier, and uh, and it is also from the uh, from the fifties, but uh, it is devalued by society because people do it or see it as an ugly building, and they don't understand how it has been uh, um, defined in origins. Later, here over there in the third image, we have like, like a foundation stone, stone from the urban uh, project of Arturo Soria, which is from the nine, for, from the end of the 19th century, so it's about 125 years ago. The original first stone, uh, it is uh, today in a sculpture in the, in, in, a, in the middle of a big square, but people do not see it because it's not, it is kind of um, hidden into this square and it should be valorized because it's uh, 135 years old uh, sculpture already. Or these two last examples, we have like some urban um, elements in the city of Madrid that maybe could be included as uh, something very uh, particular of the neighborhood under the district of Tidalineal. Furthermore, because time is over right now, I wanted to show some other examples already. Some of the churches that, uh, due to this uh, big other plan, has been included and people are not considering it unvalorizing it. Just yes, have a look at the at the spaces around, or even some recent um, some recent um, street art that really people get identified with them due to the images they talk about. Or maybe even some big buildings that, in the urban way, they have like a real presence and uh, a huge uh, uh, visual image. Finally, and before finishing, I just want to show you. I wanted to share with you some conclusion already because this work has been uh, shared with some experts from iCommerce Spain, and we got some initial conclusions of all this process. I wanted to share with you today, and over there. When we talk about uh, urban cultural heritage, some of the conclusions obtained was that intangible cultural heritage, for example, in this context, is not it is largely unexplored. That maybe toponym is very interesting for studying the territory and the city and the and the neighborhoods around it, or maybe that we could um, there is um, a problem and a dichotomy between center and periphery because uh, heritage cultural heritage is in in the center, but the center is hardly inhabited by by citizens and on the other side for the collaborative workshop maybe we should uh, consider if society perceives the value of cultural heritage more easily in public spaces and in private private property or maybe if there is a lack of awareness in, of cultural heritage in most of the architecture schools not only architecture but some other of course any any other kind of schools from primary secondary or university so maybe we can start um improving the education of cultural heritage for all society and it will be very fruitful in future this is all from my side i am sorry i was a little bit time over i hope you liked it and enjoyed it and of course uh, once again thank you very much for letting me be here today muchas gracias Thank you so very much. Uh, it was really inspiring, giving us uh, information about how technology, the new technologies, can be seen as the great opportunity for uh, interpreting the city. I hope we will be back to the discussion on this topic uh, later on. We still have the third presentation ahead of us. It was supposed to be the second this afternoon, but finally it will be the third one. I would like to welcome <clears throat> with us, uh, Veronika Scherle from uh, Gdańsk University of Technology from Spain will move back to Poland, this time to Gdańsk to discuss Gdynia. Uh, I already uh, introduced uh, our speaker. Uh, she's an art historian, co-curator of award-winning exhibitions, e.g. Glass Metal Detail Gdynia Architecture Close-Up, which was presented in 2016. She's a PhD student at Gdańsk University of Technology. Uh, she works in the art department uh, Gdynia City Museum. As part of Gdynia Modernism Trail, she conducts architectural walkabouts. So let's be flaneur and let's look at the Gdynia uh, heritage uh, this time. The uh, topic of the presentation is uh, a noblement of an 
uh, unobtrusive heritage as the path to its protection as demonstrated by the modernist architecture of Gdynia. Veronika Scherle, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much for the nice uh, in interpretation and uh, welcoming. Uh, I have uh, some problems with my pilot, so it's uh, a little bit uh, nervous. But uh, today, uh, I will uh, our presentation uh, today. I will try to show you the most important activities uh, regarding the protection of Gdynia's material heritage, uh, which is modernist architecture and how it's an enablement of on, on non-obvious uh, unobtrusive heritage take, takes place. Um, okay, so I will try once again to connect with uh, Pilot. But I have some. Uh, these uh, activities uh, focus on issues such as history, protection, participation, popularization, restoration, research, education, and social and economic development. And thus, uh, present the presentation was uh, also constructed to clearly uh, distinguish these activities. Next, please. Um, Gdynia is a symbol of the Second Polish Republic and is widely known as a city established in the interwar period. Gdynia was created thanks to the decision to building a port, uh, which uh, at that time was one of the largest in Europe. Gdynia was called the Polish New York and the gate to the world from which the ocean liners sailed into the white world. Uh, it is here than less than 20 years, a city with 130,000 inhabitants and a new modern architecture, which is, uh, is it showcase was created. Next, please. Uh, but the uh, achievements of Gdynia, which were created before the war, fell into uh, oblivion in the 20s and 30s and were not consistent uh, in terms of heritage at all. Next, please. Uh, in the post-war period in the 60s, 70s, Gdynia as a first city was uh, mainly with Hall. It was a, um, a previous uh, slide. And Gdynia post-war history is also political history with workers' protests and strikes. They were bloodly uh, surprised by the communist authorities. Next, please. Changes in the um, uh, perception of Gdynia's heritage not, it did not take place until the night after uh, of communism. Since then, both self-government and local authorities, as well as those at the government uh, level, have been uh, posing a coherent policy to protect Gdynia heritage, which is modernist architecture. Next, please. Uh, one of the aspects of this protection was the recognition of Gdynia downtown as a Polish monument of history in 2015. These are the borders of the urban layout awarded this title. Next, please. The solemn uh, moment of unveiling the commemorative plaque and the president of Poland and the president of Gdynia. This is a special uh, moment for uh, our city um, in this photo. Uh, next, please. Uh, the protection of a modernist building is regulated by law on a national scale and is 
in Gdynia is also has a personal one where the owners of tenement houses themselves apply for entering the build buildings on the list of monuments and then proudly attack the most dark facade. We can see uh, two uh, Gdynia's uh, monuments, modernist uh, building. Uh, and the special uh, moment of uh, attached uh, uh, monuments marked to the facade. Next, please. Uh, a unique social uh, initiative combining heritage protection, participation and popularization is the Mini Museum, a place created out of love for Gdynia architecture in the largest interwar tenement house in Gdynia. Uh, a famous uh, building uh, called Bankowiec. Uh, is a um, Bank Gospodarstwa Krajowego retirement found residential home. Um, um, the museum collects original interior uh, design elements and uh, can be visited upon a prior appointment. Uh, next. Uh, an important factor uh, enhancing the uh, heritage are activities that uh, restore building to their original splendor. Um, the, that is the uh, restoration. Uh, here we can see an example of the restoration of the historic, um, historic marine station uh, building. Is a, uh, from outside, uh, photo from outside, and next, please, uh, we can see uh, the uh, restoration of uh, interiors. Mm, next, please. Uh, various cult uh, cultural activities are a part of the long term and uh, complementary plan to valorize heritage, for example, international conferences, modernism in Europe, modernism in Gdynia, aimed uh, at both researchers and architecture lovers. Here's a, a photo of last uh, conference. Uh, in 2018. Um, Next, please. Uh, architecture exhibition organized by the Gdynia City Museum an important role in the process of discovering Gdynia modernism and heritage. We can see uh, from two of them. Uh, one is uh, the city is born, modernism in Gdynia between the wars, and the second, Gdynia Tel Aviv, which was cooperated by Poland uh, Museum in Warsaw. Uh, next, please. Uh, yes, we can see uh, the first uh, exhibition, The City is Born, Modernism in Gdynia Between the Wars in Gdynia City Museum. Um, and uh, next, please. Uh, and uh, an exhibition of architectural details and original modernist interior design elements seen here by the participants of the conference Modernism in Europe, Modernism in Gdynia, and you can see, among others, uh, Anne Tostos, president of Docomomo, um, uh, on the uh, photo. Uh, yes, next, please. Uh, Gdynia has its own roof of modernism and a special website uh, the var um, devoted of this um, um, uh, this uh, theme, uh, Gdynia Cultural Institution, Gdynia Development Agency, organize the weekend of architecture walks along the routes of modernism uh, with guides, uh, and yes, they have also special website. You can see here uh, this buildings and uh, special modernism roots trail um, 
Mm, it's very, very interesting. Um, next, please. Uh, yes, we can see uh, uh, this uh, architectural works um, in modernist building. Uh, thousands of people are uh, joined. Um, yes, next. Uh, photographic contests are organized in which modernist architecture is the main topic. They allow especially young people to see the beauty of this architecture and appreciate its value. It's fashionable to uh, to uh, to um, join this, um, uh, this is such a contest. Mm, next, please. And this. Uh, photo of this contest. Uh, photographing modernist architecture has become fashionable. Um, more and more uh, fashionable. Uh, next, please. Uh, in Gdynia, yeah, as an open city, uh, as a city open to tourists, uh, the open house Gdynia is we can see many buildings that are in a civil interiors in this picture we can see here the cover of the pre-war tourist guide and the poster of the event are put together. Uh, they are mm, so similar, you can see. Uh, as a, like a Gdynia, like an open, open city uh, before the war and, and now. Uh, next, please. Mm, here we can see the uh, participants of the open house in Gdynia in the front of apartment building uh, of this uh, Bank Gospodarstwa Krajowego Retirement Fund residential uh, uh, home, famous building in Gdynia. Uh, next. Uh, local investors also to the modernist that associated to Dynia. It's of Dynia's entity is fashion sells well. So we can see uh, modern investment and in the right side uh, building uh, and house uh, from the uh, 30s. Uh, they are One, please. Uh, they give, uh, the local investors give the investors a modernist character, knowing that that uh, is the uh, that uh, this is what customers expect. Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, valuable to uh, to have a new uh, apartment in this uh, area, in this uh, um, a part of uh, a part of uh, Polish monument history. Oh, yeah. Uh, modernist architecture of Gdynia constitutes its unique cultural heritage whose recognition has gone beyond the local scale, uh, travesting the path from incongruity and indifference to the subject of pride and international recognition. This is the result of a long-term and comprehensive plan that includes all these activities, parts, History, protection, uh, participation, popularization, restoration, research, education, and social and economic development. Um, next, please. Uh, 
uh, there is growing sense of multiple identity integration and responsibility of this uh, of the residents and Sardinia that have won international recognition by being of you know here's a screenshot from UNESCO tentative list unit website you can see here from uh, 2019 and next and yeah this is uh, mm, Ar Gdynia's architecture uh, from Forties, uh, seventies, uh, and uh, from now, it's a mix uh, collage from, uh, but is uh, in reality, uh, is uh, our our modernity, our heritage modernity is our future, um, uh, and uh, I would like you to. Um, thank, thanks for your um, attention and, and for uh, pro technical problems and for my rush, <laughs> but it was scary to, um, to have enough information. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you so very much for presenting us the case of Gdynia. Uh, I would like to invite uh, all of the speakers of this very session and uh, ask the people who are still with us if there are some questions. Uh, I don't see anyone, uh, I don't see any questions in the chat. So. I will use this privilege uh, to ask um, some questions by myself. I already, uh, already presented some questions to Alexander Wupienko, so uh, let me uh, let me ask uh, Hector uh, Manuel Aliaga de Miguel uh, about some issues dedicated to his presentation. <clears throat> I'm uh, wondering uh, what is the uh, response uh, of the society in the communities in Madrid that you are working in? Uh, are they really interested in this kind of collaboration, in this uh, participatory pro uh, program? Uh, what is the reaction of the people that you are uh, collaborating with on the site? Of course, uh, can you hear me? Yes, of course, it is a, a difficult question to answer because when it is focused on um, huge areas of big cities, actually the point is that, sorry for that, because I cannot hear you very well. Um, the point is that actually um, when you work in large district and neighborhoods and cities, normally people uh, have different opinions. And the point is that due to COVID, has been really uh, difficult right now to establish those um, those uh, workshop in in common with people. So what I have been able to do right now is just to start getting in contact with some uh, associations and group of specific people that really care about cultural heritage. So of course, um, I'm considering already that some of the population or inhabitants are not going to be interested on these topics. But on the other side, the people that really they are, and I'm already in contact with them. And we are waiting till COVID-19 let us um, be together to do those workshops uh, properly and go for walks into the district. And uh, of course, uh, that should be only a, a partially representation of the whole society. But it happens all the time that not everybody thinks way. And uh, this is uh, something that I just have to deal with during the whole research and include it into the conclusions, of course. And I have one more question concerning the uh, post-war modern architecture that you presented as a, let's say, new rediscovered heritage of Madrid. Uh, I was wondering what is the reaction of the people who live in these buildings? towards your activities are they are interested to participate in or they are somehow rejecting it uh, what is their opinion about the modern architecture in madrid 
Uh, actually, the problem, I think, like, this is a great question. Thank you for that. And and it's really a pleasure that you're interested on these topics. Normally, of course, and this is not only in Madrid, but in general, in my international experience, when I talk with people about uh, different modernist, modern architecture or resident architecture, uh, normally it is associated to something that's ugly or not as beautiful as it be for uh, heritage or for cultural heritage. So uh, I should maybe change that opinion of uh, not very beautiful or the, the image of beauty. I normally change this concept into interesting. And what I normally do is I try to explain how this um, building, it is why this building is important for the neighborhood, for the society, and of course for the um, for for the society itself and uh, how it has been defined, designed, how it has been thought in, in the very beginning. And one of the examples that I had, which was the building called Begonia, for example, this building it works in in galleries, and those galleries actually they're 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 not oriented all at the same in the same direction, and it makes like the the, the houses inside they go in, in different uh, positions and they move in, inside the building. So although outside it looks like very general, inside it changes absolutely. And when you explain that to the inhabitants and the residents, they they like it and they care and they care about this building as a heritage. But you need to really explain it. Because at the beginning, people normally has this idea of what is heritage and what it's not, what is beautiful and what is not. And it is not about that. It's about identity and the importance of these constructions into um, the city and for the society. Thank you so much. Uh, once we are discussing the uh, modern architecture and modern heritage, I would like to uh, move to Gdynia and uh, ask a similar question concerning the modern heritage of Gdynia. Gdynia was among the very first cities in Poland that recognized uh, modern architecture as a heritage. And I'm uh, really intrigued uh, about the response of the uh, people in Gdynia. And especially today, after many years of presenting, discussing modernism in Gdynia, um, how this architecture and how modern architecture is being received by the people of Gdynia, uh, is it treated as a heritage or is it still some kind of a controversy dedicated to this issue? Uh, thank you for this question. Um, hmm. In my opinion, in my observation, uh, like a um, musealist and uh, uh, some researcher about Vinya's uh, uh, modernist architecture, uh, people, um, in the inhabitants and tourists, and um, they they know that Gdynia is a modernist city and um, is the, uh, it is uh, her heritage and it's um, I think they know it's it's Gdynia is a um, modernist city is uh, it's obvious now uh, this uh, long term um, uh, coherent plan of uh, so so much activity um, uh, for uh, 20 years it results this um, this um, a status like Gdynia uh, that Gdynia has a heritage which is modern and these monuments are uh, young, but they are valuable, and uh, people know that that uh, uh, modern is is a young monument, but it's still valuable and uh, worth uh, to the um, to one title of uh, UNESCO uh, to to be on a, a UNESCO list. Okay, thank you so very much. Actually, our time is uh, gone. Uh, we should uh, we should conclude. 
And uh, if there are more questions, uh, as I see in the chat, I would like to invite all of the participants uh, for the uh, final uh, presentation of this very evening at uh, 5 p.m. We will have the opportunity to uh, meet with Laimona Biedis uh, from Vilnius uh, and to listen to the presentation of uh, Vilnius Chados. And actually, I think it will be the perfect uh, conclusion of our session uh, dedicated to being flaneur in the city, excavating the unknown topics in the city heritage. Uh, I think that many of the problems uh, that will be discussed uh, at, uh, during his presentation uh, were already uh, included in the, in the presentation of this very day of the resilience session. Tomorrow, we will start at 10 a.m. with a discussion about the 30 years of the Visegrad Group and Cultural Heritage. And at uh, 12, uh, we will have one more session dedicated to resilience. So, uh, it was a very uh, long day, but uh, I would like to thank to all of the participants for the fantastic presentations, for many intriguing and important ideas. And uh, last but not least, I would like to invite all of you for the lecture by Laimunas Briedis. This is all for uh, right now. Thank you so very much. See you at 5 p.m.